13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, yes, right, we've had a problem here. This is Houston. Say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Okay, I was, I was born uh, at the old Biloxi Hospital on the beachfront uh, back in 1933, November of 1933. And the uh, first uh, home we lived in was actually a duplex on Lemieux Street, uh, just over the railroad tracks, about four houses uh, up from the Barks uh, root beer factory. And I spent a lot, I was very interested. I spent a lot of time, I walked down the street and looking ahead of side window. You could look in at all the mechanical uh, aspects of bo box bottles, all glass in those days, coming down the assembly line, uh, getting filled and what caps put on them. I was amazed at uh, the machinery that was uh, doing that. Uh, we later moved and the only house uh, uh, mom and dad owned was on Church Street. Uh, out uh, just off uh, single block street off division street where the uh, north end of that street ran right into the Garnfo elementary schoolyard and uh, of course that street has since, since been named after Powell 13 flight uh, Hay Street at single block street uh, I have two sisters uh, Brenda now Brenda Johnston who uh, was seven years and five months uh, younger than I and even a younger daughter is actually, I was starting to head off to college, uh, was my sister Edie, who was 17 years uh, uh, younger than me. And so that, that, that was the family. I had no brothers, I was the oldest. My mom was just a, a homemaker uh, during most of that period. Uh, my dad uh, worked for the VA center, initially at the Biloxi facility, and I forget which shop. Well, initially he was in the boiler room. And I remember sometimes as a little kid, I'd go with him to work and spend a few hours in this boiler room that was furnishing the steam for the heating and heating water. And uh, again, all that, all that machinery down in that sort of basement area, uh, the, one of the main, near the, one of the main hospitals. Uh, he then took over one of the uh, shops. I'm not sure it was a carpenter or machine shop and eventually uh, ran all the shops both at the uh, Biloxi facility and later also the Gulfport facility. Uh, my dad was a good handy person, could do almost anything, uh, any type of task that way. Well, it was a very simple, easy kind of life, I guess I'd describe it. Uh, you were free. Uh, I, I had uh, really had no bicycle until uh, I got to uh, being a paper boy. But you ran everywhere, even like school at Garnflow, at right down the block, I'd just run to school. There was no cafeteria, so you either brought a brown bag, uh, which I did most of the time with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a banana or apple, because it gave me more playtime at lunchtime on the playground, or I ran home for lunch, and all the, all the children did that. Uh, I first got a mobile device uh, as a bicycle when uh, I was in uh, junior high, uh, 12 years old, and started as a paper boy for the Biloxi Gulfport Daily Herald. Paper route was Route 16, uh, which ran uh, from Cruces to uh, Main Street, east-west, and ran from Beach Boulevard to Howard Avenue, north-south. Had 100, about 170 papers, most time, roughly. Big route. 
Uh, Chester Rose Jr. had the biggest route. He had the one way out uh, near the city limits at Rodenburg Avenue. He had all that area. And, uh, and we rolled them except for Thursdays. The Thursday papers, which had all uh, grocery store ads and big ad ads, normally uh, you, you had, uh, eventually we got uh, rubber bands to put around them. Because uh, you tried to roll those, you'd normally break them. Uh, they split. But uh, that was an afternoon route. Uh, so that somewhat uh, prohibited me from uh, being in sports in high school because that was any sport you normally the training was after school and I did play nighttime softball out at the uh, back bay uh, park near the fire station just north of going for school uh, but uh, anyway I ended up uh, interested in journalism because I worked uh, on the high school newspaper the Biloxi High Tide and was sports editor uh, one year and that got me interested in, uh, in that direction. We were bored a lot of times waiting for the papers to come in. The papers were uh, printed in Gulfport. So we had to wait till a truck uh, came to Biloxi to drop them all out for our various routes uh, to, uh, to start to work, really. So in that interim, uh, we would do things uh, like one, one thing, I guess you call it uh, start of teamwork and timing. Uh, it required two people to do the, the thing. Uh, when a car went by, and I think that was Jackson Street, uh, goes right by the, the, then the Herald office, uh, one boy would go out and slap on the fender of a car going by, the back fender, and another boy would go lay down in the street. So it'd make the people think that they had run over somebody and laying in the street behind them. Uh, so, you know, we did fun things like that to, uh, to pass the time. Uh, yes, I did. I, uh, incidentally, the, the, pa the paper business and the way that it was set up was by Mr. E.P. Wilkes. He was the uh, owner of the paper at that time. And it was like you were running a small business. You bought the papers. There were two cents of paper. It was a six-day uh, paper. Uh, didn't have a Sunday paper. Most people either got the Mobile Register or the Times-Picayune for Sunday paper. And at two cents of paper, that was 12 cents. Uh, for six days, and you charge the customer 20 cents. And with 170 papers, uh, roughly if you add that up, I was earning almost $17 a week, which is very good money. But it was up to me to do the collections, and I had to keep a set of books uh, on the route and the, and the customers, and X off by the week when they paid or didn't pay, and that kind of thing. Again, going to Mr. Wilkes, he was also my scoutmaster in Troop uh, 212 in the scouts, so he was a, a good mentor in that sense as well, with some of the values you learn in scouting. Uh, I did, uh, after, after working a high school paper, uh, I went off to college and continued uh, with the thought of going into journalism as a career. Summers, I still worked for the uh, Daily Herald as a part-time uh, reporter. I was kind of junior to Jack Nelson, who was the big reporter at the time. And a very good boss I had uh, overall was Cosman Eisendrath. He was the, he was the big uh, news leader at the Biloxi office. And uh, at, at Perkinson, I again, the first year was uh, Perkinson Junior College, was the only campus then, uh, later Mississippi Gulf Coast grew, of course. Uh, I was sports editor the first year, and I became editor of the Bulldog Barks uh, the second year. Uh, from there, uh, that was 1952, uh, when I graduated from Perk, and rather than go off to uh, journalism, I, I thought about going to the University of Missouri, which was a renowned uh, school in journalism. But the Korean War was on, and I decided to serve my country, so I enlisted into a program called the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. And that led me to training initially at Pensacola, Florida, and eventually to Kingsville, Texas, uh, to qualify and get uh, Naval Aviator Wings in 1954, April of 54. Yeah, I was, uh, I was at that time, I was a Marine cadet at graduation and that, that earned a commission as a second lieutenant into the Marine Corps. I went back briefly to uh, Texas for jet training and then was assigned to a Marine fighter squadron at Cherry Point, North Carolina. At that time, I uh, flew uh, Banshees. They were two engine uh, fighter bomber. Uh, in the first squadron, VMF 533, 
which no longer exists. Uh, I'm sorry, it does exist. Uh, the second Marine Squadron I went into, VMF 114, had Cougars, a swept wing uh, Grumman airplane uh, jet that uh, now has been disbanded. VMF 114 does not exist anymore. Uh, and, tra and training, of course, the jets I flew at that time was called the uh, TV-1 or TV-2 uh, Navy version of the Shooting Star. And But uh, other, after flying with the Marine Corps, I uh, actually went to back to school to get an engineering degree because I had uh, reading books that got interested in becoming a test pilot. And to be a test pilot requires you to also be an engineer, not just fly the airplane, but to be a part of the uh, development and testing, uh, then about ultimately testing of the vehicle. So I went back to school at the University of Oklahoma. The most and reason being the very convenient, and they had a slot open, was to join the Oklahoma Air National Guard, also a fighter squadron, so I could keep my currency and high performance aircraft while going to college for three years at OU to get a degree in aeronautical engineering. And by that time, I'd searched out uh, whether to become a company test pilot, I investigated at several companies. My squadron commander at the time had started at one time as an engineer at NASA Langley. And uh, he recommended I look at joining uh, NACA when we first talked, because NASA had not become NASA yet. Uh, but at the time I graduated, it had just become NASA by one year. And I applied at several NASA centers, but the only one that had an opening was Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, now named Glenn Research Center after John Glenn. And so that's where I started to work as a NASA called as research pilots, but effectively a test pilot. Now at the time I joined uh, NASA at uh, Lewis, the first seven astronauts had been chosen, <clears throat> but it was not apparent uh, that there would be anything beyond that program, Mercury. So most of us thought, well, they'll test whether humans can survive in space, fly those, those flights, and that would be it. That would be the space program. So it really wasn't until the later announcement of Apollo that uh, turned me on the thinking of uh, getting into the astronaut program. By then, I had moved to Edwards Air Force Base in NASA's Flight Research Center, which really was their premier aircraft test base operation, and uh, had the X-15 program going on at that time. And it was when I was there that I decided I'd apply for the astronaut program, which for me was just another transfer. I was already a NASA employee, so it was just another transfer and a move to Houston to the Manned Spacecraft Center, which is now named Johnson. Gemini program was underway. Uh, the Apollo program was in the background that was going to happen uh, when I joined NASA. Well, that, that was the reason I, I transferred. It was funny, at one point, uh, Neil, who had uh, was ahead of me about three years, Neil started with NASA at Lewis and went to Edwards. And then Neil uh, applied and uh, went into the astronaut program. He visited back at the uh, Flight Research Center. and. Don Malik and I, another pilot, talked to him and asked him what it's like to be an astronaut. Neil's uh, uh, summary for us was, well, you attend a lot of meetings, you sit in a simulator a lot, and you don't do much good flying. So that was Neil's summary of being an astronaut. Because, you know, you don't fly to space that often, whereas at Edwards, we were flying every day something. I was normally involved in three different test programs at the same time. So I had to think real hard about whether I should even apply. But then I said, well, it's a chance to go to the moon, and that'd be a great adventure. And if I stay here at Edwards, I'm not going to have that chance. So that's really what convinced me I should apply and uh, sign up for the astronaut program. You go through a rookie, uh, at that time, a year of training. I think today, they just put the latest group through two years. Uh, we, we were supposed to have a year of, I uh, call it rookie training, and it turned out uh, things got so busy in the early development of, uh, of uh, this Apollo vehicles, uh, command module, uh, lunar module, the spacesuit, that they needed us to do uh, support roles 
uh, following the development of various uh, parts. And so I really only got about uh, probably nine to ten months of that rookie training before I got a first assignment uh, to, to, uh, under Jim McDivitt and that crew who were slated to fly the first lunar module in Earth orbit on a mission. And uh, Jim McDivitt, uh, Ed Mitchell and I, who later walked on the moon, reported to uh, Jim and he gave us simple instructions. He said, I want you to go to Grumman, the company that was building the lunar module, and I want you to make sure I got a good limb to fly. That was it. So Ed and I, between us, we spent the next uh, almost a year at Grumman in the, involved in the uh, testing, early testing of all the uh, lunar modules up to uh, LIM-5, the first uh, vehicle that ended up landing on the moon, uh, assuring they made it through factory tests and were ready to ship to Kennedy Space Center to get ready for launch. How you got your crew assignments was kind of a mystery. Uh, it, was, I, it was mostly done uh, between uh, Deke Slayton, who was head of uh, flight operations at the time, and Al Shepard, who was head of the astronaut office. And I think they uh, si sort of lined up the crews. Generally speaking, uh, uh, as I found out later when I was named backup commander of 16, they would, one of them would call you in the office and tell you your position and suggest who might be with you on the crew and give you an opportunity to say if that was acceptable or not. So at any rate, my first assignment was really because of uh, Mike Collins having a medical problem. He was on the prime crew of Apollo 8 and uh, could not fly the mission because of that. So Jim Lovell, who was on the backup crew, moved up to that prime crew assignment and that opened a position. So my first real crew assignment was as the backup lunar module pilot on Apollo 8 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. We were the backup crew. We had uh, simulators uh, both at uh, Houston only single command module and one lunar module. We had two command module simulators and one lunar module at Kennedy, which is where, when you're closest to getting the fly, you'd use those simulators. These were uh, configured just like the real spacecraft. If you went in the command module simulator, you laid on a couch. Uh, we cheated because most time we weren't in our spacesuits for padding, so they had pads to lay on. But the instrument panel was exactly geometry-wise, uh, real spacecraft, everything in there, exactly like the spacecraft interior. The systems uh, through a computer uh, functioned uh, just and gave you emulation uh, sent, uh, the readings on meters exactly as if the systems were really operating. Uh, they also could impart failures, uh, what we call credible failures in the systems. In fact, the command module simulator, they had the capability to put in over 500 failures that you had to train to learn about and how to handle. And similarly with the lunar module, although there were fewer with it, uh, it, it has a simpler, simpler vehicle than the command module. At this point, yes, I was married to uh, Mary Griffin Grant. She was one of the uh, three, three Grant daughters to Bill Grant, William Grant, who had the uh, Grant drugstore at the time. Uh, Mary Griffin was the uh, middle, middle child. And uh, at the time I flew, uh, we had three children and one child on the way. Uh, Mary was pregnant at the time. Well, I, I say that was a problem because you were gone all the time. Uh, when you were on a mission, everything, literally everything we did wasn't where you lived at Houston. The simulators mostly we used were in Florida. Uh, if you were testing the real spacecraft, you were at the North American plant in California or the one in Grumman that was built in, uh, in New York that was built in the lunar module. And of course, in tests when they arrived at Kennedy, when they were getting ready uh, to, to get launched. Uh, and for the Apollo landing missions I was on, 11, uh, 13, and 16, I had geology field training. A lot of that, and that, that was done all around the world at different places where they'd set up for geology uh, field training exercise. I did some, over 30 of those. Uh, I, I think probably only my daughter and maybe my next son in lineup uh, had that perspective. Uh, I, I, you know, my daughter at the time I think was 14 years old, 
So they, you know, today it was just another, uh, another thing I was in, Dad was involved with, unfortunately not home that much. What happened uh, on our mission was uh, a week before launch, uh, inadvertently, Charlie Duke uh, had taken a son to a birthday party and had been exposed to measles. Uh, he told the medics about that, and of course, they did then a bunch of testing, taking blood almost every morning and sending it somewhere for analysis, somewhere for analysis. And uh, three days before launch uh, was determined and a decision made that Ken Manningly, being a bachelor, had never been married, had never had measles as a child, was very likely to come down with measles during the flight. So he was uh, removed and Jack Schweigert, the backup command module pilot, replaced him two and a half days before launch. Well, at the, at the time that happened, Jim Lovell and I were down in the landing craft, the lunar module. We had, we had looked at uh, TV shows that had been shown on previous missions, and Jim and I decided to use the lunar module as our stage for a planned TV show using equipment that we knew had not been talked about before. So it's kind of a show and tell uh, setting. And Jack Schweigert was all alone left in the command module to watch over things at the time. Uh, the, just after, it wasn't very long after we finished and closed off the TV show, this uh, big bang happened. Uh, kind of rattled through the, the vehicles are metal. So it's kind of like if you're inside of a, a big uh, barrel metal barrel and so I hits on it with a sledgehammer. Uh, rocket, little small rocket engines that normally hold attitude were firing. We could feel some motion, not very, not very uh, much motion, but some motion of the vehicles. And uh, so instantly we knew this is not normal. This is something wrong. Uh, Jim Lovell had, had drifted up into the command module by that time. Jack uh, Swigert had made the call, Houston, we've had a problem here. And Jim repeated it because Houston did not reply to Jack. And I shortly also floated up in zero G back to my position in the right couch. A uh, quick scan of the instrument panel told me from two different readings on meters that we had lost oxygen tank two, number two. We had two tanks. Number one looks still fine, still intact. So I didn't think it was life threatening instantly at that point. But I was sick to my stomach with disappointment because I knew losing even one of the two tanks meant we weren't going to get to land on the moon. It took some time of troubleshooting. Uh, in fact, uh, mission control thought for 18 minutes because of the uh, different array of caution and warning lights on in different systems that were not related in any way that it was false. They were false signals. That's something that happened in the caution and warning uh, electronics. Uh, after 18 minutes, they got busy because it was now for sure real and Jim had reported seeing a gas or something fluid flowing away from the spacecraft, seeing it out the window. And uh, we went into troubleshooting mode, mainly now because we'd also detected there was a leak in the second remaining oxygen tank. Uh, slow leak, but it, it was clear the pressure uh, quantity was going down. When I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down. Uh, it, it dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. And so we were put through a number of steps to try to isolate that leak, to save the second tank. And it really was about an hour into this that they had run out of ideas. We tried almost anything they could think of to try to try to stop that leak unsuccessfully. So it's clear we're gonna to have to shut down the mothership. Pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever had in manned space flight. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. So at that time, we were asked, Jim Lovell and I, to go to the lunar module and power it up. The thing we're gonna land on the moon with. It was a second spacecraft and could serve as a home, a lifeboat, they called it, 
that would give us an environmental system, uh, give us communication, could give us the thrusters to control, uh, all the things we would need uh, in the interim period to work our way back home. So that's what we did. We, Jim and I left and got very busy powering up the lunar module. And the critical step was transferring the inertial measuring unit angles, which is the device that tells you how to point very accurately. Because you need it very accurate to do any engine maneuvers uh, to change the path, the trajectory. So we could manually do that, but Jack given us the readings out of a <clears throat> three registers called Noun 20s that Jim could manually, he did manually crank them into the limb computer that would torque that platform when we powered it up to those angles. So we had a good platform, it was very critical. Uh, at the time, we were not going around the moon in, the, in a way that would have got us home. Uh, if we'd done nothing from that point, we would have missed the Earth. But I think about later, they did a simulation years later, figured out we'd have missed the Earth by about 3,000 miles. And probably looped around the moon twice more before eventually entering in the Earth. But at any rate, so the first critical thing was to get on a path to get us back with the moon's gravity turn to get roughly back to home. Uh, it was interesting, uh, later, I, uh, the, first, the first maneuver done, uh, Glenn Lunny had taken over from Gene Krantz as the flight director. And they, the guys were, the FIDOs, flight dynamics officers, were arguing about, well, where do you want us to, to get, get us back to? And Glenn's instruction was, just get us back to any place on Earth. So that was the first maneuver they did, and it would have landed us in the Indian Ocean by Madagascar. Uh, no, I never, never had high confidence uh, at any point that we had all everything figured out and needed to the ground. This was kind of an incremental thing of trying to stay one step ahead as things came up, like mentioned the lithium hydroxide. That took some time over a day to realize that lithium, that li uh, carbon dioxide was building up and we needed a way to get rid of it. And the lunar module, which had a different shaped cartridge of this lithium material, which could scrub the air of carbon dioxide, did not have enough. Because we're going to have to make this vehicle last four days versus two days. So they had the jury rig a way to use the abundant cartridges we had from the mothership, which was a square shape. And they figured that out and actually tested it in a chamber in building a seven at Houston. Uh, in a, they had a limb environmental system set up in the chamber and tested that it worked before they sent the instructions up to us. So they did some creative engineering to put a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. Vice versa. Had that not been able to be done, if they couldn't have found any way to do that, would the carbon dioxide have eventually taken over? It was, yeah, it was, a pro, it was at the red line when, they, when we finally got that rigged. So uh, that was another close call. That was another close call, right. Uh, the, the first two maneuvers we did, the first one to get us around the moon, the second one, two hours after we passed the low point behind the moon, was also using the computer, fully automated. Uh, that was great because that shortened our time on the return by 10 hours and also put us back where the recovery force was with the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier by the Samoan Islands. So it had benefit of that as well. The next two corrections uh, mid-course, which are very small maneuvers, not very long used. First one using a decent engine for 14 seconds. Uh, second one about 22 seconds using the 400 pound attitude thrusters, all four of them firing in one direction, uh, were done uh, to correct, tweak the trajectory on the, on the way home. Those were all done manually. Uh, Making an alignment uh, first out the window using a coas, which is like a gun sight. Jim Lovell would line on the earth cusp. It was a half earth, so he'd line on the edges of the half earth, and then pitch up to where I could see in a periscope, AOT, which is normally used to shoot stars. When I saw the sun come into view, we froze the attitude, and that's how we fixed the attitude to do those maneuvers. But controlling it manually for those very short periods. After we got back, I talked to people, and some had expressed a concern uh, about the heat shield. It never occurred, to, at least to me. Uh, the heat shield uh, is a pretty tough material. 
It's a very tough material that normally is used to dissipate the heat by somewhat burning away as you come through entry. I never suspected, because uh, when we saw the damaged area, when we separated the service module, it looked like the quarter of the spacecraft panel had blown straight out in a way, not downward toward where the heat shield was. So and it didn't look like there was that much shrapnel or anything that would, it could have damaged it. So after you cut that module away, you got to get a pretty good look at what had happened. Well, service module, yes. When we separated it, we shot a lot of pictures, in fact, of the damaged area for the accident investigation. What was y'all's reaction to that? Well, we, we were somewhat shocked by the amount of damage we saw, because like I said, a, a quarter of the spacecraft had blown off. And there was uh, broken wires hanging out, torn thermal blankets, you know, quite a bit of disarray in that area. And thinking back, the the uh, intent of the explosion we felt uh, did not seem that severe, frankly, for what we, the damage we saw. Uh, yes, following that mission, uh, we did some public affairs, obviously, uh, which is pretty traditional after a mission. Whoever had just flown was put on a circuit. Uh, we had a uh, parade in Chicago, ticker tape parade, which I missed. I, I had gotten ill with a urinary tract infection, and so I did not make that trip. We went to testify to a Congress committee, uh, a lot of other public affairs events, both uh, in the States as well as overseas. But within a month, uh, Deke uh, Slayton called me in and told me I had an, another new job as the backup commander to Apollo 16. So I was ha very happy with that. I thought, well, here I maybe have a second chance uh, to get back because at that time, the last mission to the moon was Apollo 19, which flying 16 would have had me fly 19. So uh, I, I was happy I had built uh, Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue assigned with me as the crew. And uh, so, I, like I said, we were training for about four or five months uh, before 18 and 19 got canceled. So I had a second point of disappointment. I was, uh, I went off briefly to Harvard Business School. I, long range, I was interested in getting into program management. And I got back, uh, for, it was a pressure cooker course, program for management development, four months. Uh, course, and I went into the Arbiter Project Office. So I really went into program management on early shuttle uh, for four years. Uh, so I was there from day one when we were evaluating the proposals on who should build it, all the way through uh, getting it uh, through the design phase into the uh, early testing phase, and then, of course, uh, getting ready to fly the first vehicle, Enterprise, and at that time, I was really surprised and happy. I was named as one of four people that were going to get to fly Enterprise, the very first orbiter we built at a program out at Edwards Air Force Base in 1977, where we we're going to air launch it off the top of a 747. So we had an eight test flight program, and I got to command five of the eight flights in that program. But you never flew the shuttle into space. I never flew into space. I was designated to fly the third orbital mission. Uh, at the time, I would have stayed had we kept the mission. Uh, Jack Lausma was going to fly it with me, and we were going to go up and rescue Skylab. Skylab was uh, fixing the worried about falling in, and our, we, thought we were training, including building a little kick stage following the development of a little booster that we're going to fly in the payload bay that Jack actually was training to fly it. After we got close on the rendezvous, he was gonna, we were gonna release it and he would fly it over and dock it with Skylab. And then the mission control would worry about which way Skylab's pointing and fire the booster after we got clear. Uh, but the, unfortunately, uh, the shuttle launch schedule slipped, went further out and Skylab fell in earlier than even they thought with uh, sunspot activity activity 
that uh, ballooned our atmosphere a bit and caused more drag, and Skylab fell in more quickly. So I, when that mission went away, uh, the mission that then was going to be flown, uh, I, I wasn't interested in. So I had the opportunity to uh, become an aerospace executive at Grumman Corporation in New York. So I uh, left NASA at that point in 1979. And that was while I was in the program office, actually. I'd been in the shuttle program office, and I was doing sport flying with uh, a, a group that was putting on air shows, <clears throat> at, uh, mainly at Galveston or Dallas-Fort Worth, mostly in the Texas area, using World War II aircraft, some real ones, B-17, P-40. Uh, I was involved in the opening act of the show, which was using a number of aircraft that had been modified to look like Japanese aircraft. And we, we staged the attacks on Pearl Harbor, where they had some pyrotechnics set up in the field. And we actually didn't start at that field. We started at another field and came roaring in like the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, I was flying what was a converted Volte vibrator, a BT-13, pre-World War II trainer that had been converted to look like the Japanese Val dive bomber. And one day I was just ferrying it from a short distance from Angleton, Texas, where it had been kept at a crop duster seal to Galveston Shoals Field to get washed up on a rack we had there to get ready for the next air show at Dallas. And I got too close on an airplane ahead of me. We flew in formation. And I was afraid I was gonna run over, over on, on the runway and did a go around putting the power on and at about 300 foot altitude, the engine quit. So I switched uh, quickly fuel tanks to the other wing tank, pumped the wobble pump, which is a little hand pump to get fuel pressure and it could get the engine to sputter, run for a little bit and then quit. So I milked it around anyway. I was headed right into the Gulf of Mexico, southbound, and I did not want to go in the Gulf because it had a fixed gear. I couldn't raise the landing gear fixed airplane. And I knew if I went in the Gulf, it'd probably flip over upside down. And it was shallow water. I'd be trapped in it. You want to be in deep water. If you're going in the water, it's going to flip over. So anyway, I made, made it around 180 degrees and landed on the far west side of Shoals Field. And when I hit in some uh, not necessarily smooth terrain, eventually ended up being part of a housing project, I uh, one gear broke off. Wing dug in, it flipped, and I ended up upside down backwards, and it caught on fire. Before I could uh, get out, because the canopy was jammed shut, and I had to kick a hole to get out, I received burns over 65%. And the uh, ambulance was already on the way. The person about a block over saw this happen. And they called the ambulance to pick me up, take me to the uh, University of Texas Hospital at Galveston to the burn ward there where I spent the next three months uh, going through uh, the, the taking care of the, the burns, including debris in, and eventually grafting before I could get released. Well, as you said, I've received a, a lot of awards. Uh, some uh, I, I feel uh, uh, are more precious. Uh, I've enjoyed more and appreciated more because they were from peers, like from the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. I was test pilot of the year, uh, one year after the, the shuttle test. And because uh, that's uh, made by voting of your peers. Uh, this one is also exceptional in that way. This is by my hometown, uh, who I spent a lot of years here. And I'll have to say I was chasing those uh, rainbows I chased uh, in, new, in dreams of more adventures to do. It took me away for about 45 years, although I came back often to visit my mother and uh, sister's family uh, over those years, whenever I could get an airplane and fly in the Keesler Air Force Base. Uh, so this is a particular honor to be so honored. I hope the statue uh, serves more as, uh, not as a Fred Hayes thing over time, but as a representation if you grow up even in a small town like Biloxi, with the right upbringing and uh, the right training and education along the way, uh, what you can achieve. Well, what, what's the, the honor you're talking about there, which is also great, is the uh, A1 test stand. Uh, there's an A1, there's an A2, and the, the B stand is where the uh, current SLS 
uh, big rocket is sitting in that they're going to test shortly. Uh, the A-1 stand uh, was used to test uh, J-2 engines, which were uh, the engines on the second and the third stage of the Saturn. So I, the Saturn I flew had six of those engines, J-2 engines. So there's obviously a direct inf affinity that uh, engines I, that uh, I depended on that got me on my way to the moon uh, came out of a Stennis that got me on my way. Uh, so I, I, it's a great honor. Later it did a, lo a lot of testing on the shuttle engine, the liquid SSMEs, they're called. Uh, so all through the shuttle program, it, that the stand was used for that. I guess the creation uh, came through uh, uh, Roy Estes, uh, Leo Seal, and Myron Webb, who was that time uh, public affairs. Uh, they decided with 9-11 and the security requirements that were imposed on all NASA facilities, but at Stennis, it pretty much uh, dampened any of uh, the tenants they had at the Stenosphere, which is a small museum out at Stennis. So between the three of them, they wanted to create something off-site. And uh, so the way that it was set up, it was with a not-for-profit that Mr. Leo Seal was the initial chairman, and he asked me to join the board. That was like 14 years ago. And uh, I, was, I was interested primarily uh, for what I would see it would do with children's education. And what, what, at least at that time, we were surmising would be the content in this uh, museum. So that's why I uh, joined the board. I'd been retired at that point from Northrop Grumman. And so that's what got me out of my rocking chair uh, to join the board here. And I've been involved uh, ever since. With well, they have, a, they have a plan and a program, and they're developing uh, the hardware at this point. Whether it meets, number one, the schedule they've got laid out, <clears throat> and whether ultimately they achieve the goal, it depends on the uh, annual funding levels. <clears throat> Their plan requires a certain funding level <clears throat> that would have to be approved through administration and Congress. And it's, the, the, old, the old question mark is always, will Congress support it in uh, that way? Do you think we should be going back? I think we should be going back to then, there and also Mars. We ought to continue exploration, not just uh, with people, but the un unmanned uh, work that's been done by JPL to look at uh, all, all parts of our solar system. And hopefully, if we find the right exoplanet, they call it, that's out there around another star system, way, way far out there, maybe even have a, a capability to send a probe uh, to look at things there. Fred, we've got your space suit here. Tell me about it. Okay, this suit is an A7L suit. It was the same space suit worn all through the Apollo missions, including this particular one for the people who landed on the moon and walked on the moon, because it has four fittings. Uh, four, the four fittings are for the hoses and the spacecraft that fed you, uh, your life support, uh, oxygen, and the other two were to hook up the backpack when you put on your pliss. It was called the backpack to a walk on the moon. You hooked up to those fittings. The upper uh, left-hand one, the small one, is where you hooked up your communication uh, to talk. And the right-hand one is more for, used for emergency with a thing called the OPS. It was a little uh, thing that set up on top of the backpack, the plus, that gave you an emergency oxygen supply. So did you have a problem on the moon, for instance, uh, where you develop a hole in a suit or a leak, you could use that emergency oxygen supply to get back in the landing craft safely uh, before your suit deflated. Uh, otherwise, you had various pockets to carry uh, uh, implements and uh, the pockets. We used che we had checklists in those pockets, for instance, during launch, uh, your launch checklist. Uh, the implements you see, uh, well, one is the helmet. I see we're missing a pair of gloves. Uh, the gloves, as you see, hooked up to metal rings on the suit on each arm and had what we call lock locks. In other words, a double lock so the glove could not come off. And the same on the neck ring where this helmet here would be hooked up. Now in this suit you wore padding. 
because uh, the suit, when it pressurized, is stiff uh, with the, the pressure in it. And we're, we're at various places it rubs, if you're trying to move, like your wrist, those metal rings rub. So I actually had a pair of cut socks to be padding on my wrist area. Uh, when you walk, tried to walk, lifting your foot, even you, you hit on the top of the boot, the hard boot. So I had the extra padding on my uh, feet socks uh, for that. I had padding on the shoulders for the same reason, because uh, the suit would rub on your shoulders if you had it fit right. You had to have it fit uh, tighter than you would uh, normally, because when it pressurized, it stretched lightly. So for instance, uh, you had to pad the arms fit so when you had the gloves on and it wasn't pressurized, you had to kind of hold your shoulders back, keep your hands, your fingers from being too tight in the end of the gloves. Because you wanted it fitted, so when it pressurized, you had the, your fingers right at the ends of the gloves. Uh, this suit uh, uh, was a lot of work to use. Uh, it was, when it pressurized, it, was, it stayed, tried to stay in one position. Like the arms are like this. And if you moved, or squeezed, that took work because you're working against the suit. In the same way if you walk. Uh, so that's why you saw people on the moon, they hopped. It was easier to hop than to walk. So that was a thing they worked out to uh, take, take account of that. Unfortunately, uh, this suit I wore on the Apollo 13 mission looks very clean. Uh, it doesn't have any lunar dust on it. Uh, so our mission uh, got scrubbed after an oxygen tank explosion, so I did not get to walk on the moon. I, I wish this suit looked a little dirtier here. Uh, some of the other implements you see at the bottom of the case here, that's a hammer that we had. Uh, if you actually were out on a geology survey and you wanted to chip a rock to look at the granular structure or something, that would hammer or, or break off a piece of rock, off a larger rock, you could do it with that hammer device. The other thing was, uh, much like a, a device you might have to pick up trash as you're walking along the street. That was, you could squeeze it and it would grip. In this case, you'd grip small rocks. you grab small rocks without having to bend down on one knee or anything to get at it. So that was what that tool was for. I'm not sure what the other bag in here is because it's, it's not a space bag. That's a bag we carried our airplane helmets in.